we had a friend who used to use this old saying, and it's trite, I know. You know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Well, I would say make lemon curd because it's very good <laughs> on... It's delicious. Yeah, and it's wonderful on a scone or, you know, nice a tart. filling, a tad or a filling sure. between, oh, you know, a nice uh, butter <laughs> cake. Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and inspiring guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and fellow Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion online course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. And now, as a thank you to my podcast listeners, I'm offering a $20 off coupon for a limited time. Just use the code PODCAST2018, all caps, at checkout. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me and my coffee in my hand. So let's begin. We have a real treat for you today. We have Marilyn and Sheila Brass, cookbook authors, television personalities, and culinary historians. Marilyn, who's 76, and Sheila is 81. They host, and they're also the co-executive producers of the James Beard Foundation-nominated television series, The Food Flirts, for PBS. It's a nationally aired series, and it features the sisters exploring the diversity of cuisines and cultures in America in a way that only they can do. Calling the sisters dessert geniuses, Food and Wine magazine selected both of their cookbooks for its annual volumes, the best of the best, 25 cookbooks, and the Brass Sisters won a throwdown with Iron Chef Bobby Flay by baking their mother's recipe for pineapple upside down cake. Welcome, ladies. We're thrilled to be here. <laughs> yes, this- uh, it's going to my head. <laughs> no, the, and and likewise. Oh no, no! It's the microphone, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone. We went love to the my microphones. Head. Yeah, you're feeling professional. Is that? Oh, what it, it is? well, I just think that that the microphones. This is Marilyn. Yeah. Our fashion statement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You are, it's sort of like the two of you play off each other. Oh, and you yeah. Kinda, you, you love each other. You know, it's like you're a little bit of a um, an act, right? A comedy act. Well, someone once described us, Nicole, as sort of our own ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is Marilyn. And, you know, after a while, you'll be able to tell the difference in our voices. But we start and finish each other's sentences. Uh-huh. And we're very polite to one another. We yes. always have been. We always have been. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just the type of thing where I have been called an alpha sister, which mm. really is not true because um, I'll tell you this. I can talk for about two minutes, and then Sheila will make one comment and pull the whole thing together. I see. So you need each other. Oh, we, we do. We need each other and, and we, we enjoy, want each other. Want and, each other. Yeah, and we enjoy each other. Has that always been true growing up, ladies? Yes. Has it always been the yes, two of Yes, it has. And yeah. part of that was, is, I should say, um, because we brought each other up. Mm-hmm. Our mother passed away almost 57 years ago, and our father passed away 41 years ago. And when our mother passed away, um, I, Marilyn, was... 20 and Sheila was 25 Mm -hmm. so we you know had to bring each other up 
Mm-hmm. And you have had so many uh, reinventions. I, uh, now, you you have always lived in Massachusetts, is that correct? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And then so as kids and then you went to school and then you had careers that uh, were not necessarily related to cooking. That's right. Uh, you know, in our family, uh, there was no kidding around. I, at the age of three, was referred to as the writer, even though I couldn't write at that point. Uh, Sheila was always referred to as the artist. Later it changed, you know, I, I actually started writing when I was like, um, you know, creative writing when I was like seven. And Sheila began to do dress designs because our, and our maternal grandmother had been a couturier in Russia with her own business. And she had six girls working for her in her atelier. So anyway, uh, our parents always knew what we were going to be. Before we knew it, really. Yeah. And that felt okay to you, or did you oh, fight that a little bit? Oh, it was wonderful. No. They were pretty smart people. They knew. <laughs> and the wonderful thing about them was, they, in some ways, they were very old world and very careful, but they knew enough that when you had a dream, when you have a, had a child who had a dream, you nurtured that dream. And they never said to us, you're girls and you can't do that. Or, uh -huh. or you know, we're not a wealthy family, so you can't do that. We so always women, found a way. Women role models were very important to both of you. Well, I have to say that you know, thinking back, both of our grandparents, each set, married for love. They did not have arranged marriages. Both of them ran a matriarchy, the Brasses and the Katzips, my mother's family. And so we always had role models uh, who were strong, vocal women. Mm -hmm. And it worked, Nicole. It worked. Mm -hmm. And when did you, so I remember you talking about learning cooking, learning baking at your mother's knee. Is, were you interested in it um, at that yes. time? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, she was going to talk a little bit about how we learned to bake and cook from our mother, Dorothy Katz of Brass. Well, Dorothy Katz of Brass was a wonderful cook and baker. Self-taught. Self-taught. Mm -hmm. she, she could just make a tray of brownies before she got and a chocolate, um a chocolate cake. Yeah, and that was it. Chocolate velvet but cake. But that was enough. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. mother met my father when the two in mother yeah, the mothers in law to be decided that they would figure out if this one son and one daughter could get together and see what happened. happened. Now, and I'm going to take over just a little bit. Very low fireworks. Very low fireworks. <laughs> well, you have to remember, I'm, I'm sort of stepping in here, for, if Sheila doesn't mind. No? Okay. Well, you notice I checked with her. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what happened, and we're going to give you the short version because we have lots of stuff we want to discuss with you. Yes. And your audience. That's right. Uh, okay. This was in 1935, and my mother, wh who was known as one of the, uh, the most beautiful girls in Winthrop, Massachusetts, mm. was uh, doing a little dusting around the house on Seafoam Avenue. We, we lived five minutes from the ocean. And she was wearing yellow shorts, a white T-shirt, and a yellow ribbon in her bird black hair. And she was absolutely beautiful. Well, the two mothers-in-law met at a grocery store, and the Brasses had done a summer rental. And Winthrop was a resort town then. So what happened was Mrs. Brass said to her son, Harry, I have to make a phone call. And they didn't have a phone for the summer. So she asked her son, Harry, to take her over to Mrs. Katziff's house mm -hmm. where she could make a phone call. And 
as I said, we come from a straw, a line of strong women. Well, anyway, nature took its course. Uh, <laughs> the two young people uh, started the talk, and my mother said that my father had lovely skin, and he was very up on current affairs. Ah. And so my father um, was very intrigued with my mother because she was beautiful and she was smart, and they were engaged six weeks later. But my mother didn't know how to cook. She actually was self-taught, and we had wonderful food in the house, wonderful um, wonderful baking going on, homemade holly, or holla, as some people holla. pronounce it. Sure. And um, chopped liver, chopped herring. Uh, the Sabbath was always uh, celebrated with traditional foods, all the Jewish holidays. Mm -hmm. And um, what she did was to bring us to the table. And that sounds like a really good title for a cookbook. So we're mm. going to tuck that away. Yes. She brought us to the kitchen table on the second floor of a three-decker house in Winthrop, Massachusetts. And she showed us that baking was a way of showing love for your family. You could be creative and you could be adventuresome mm -hmm. by going in the kitchen and making something for someone you love. And little always, did she know. Little did she know. And we had our own set of uh, baking uh, utensils, our own child size rolling oh, pin. Oh my goodness. And we had a little um, loaf pan so we could make our own braided hullies. Oh. And we gosh. made jam tart, which is like a turnover. You know, there'd be a scrap of pie dough left. That's right. And yeah. we'd make a little turnover, a jam tart. And we'd use the prongs of the fork, you know, to, to seal it. Seal it. And oh. we still have the um, the implement she used to seal, to crimp the uh, edges of her pineapple yes. pies and her oh. apple pies. Mm -hmm. And it was just absolutely wonderful. And we also learned how to cook from her. And I, what I remember, and I'm growing, I'm waxing nostalgic. She had a little um, aqua-colored tin with a camel or a dromedary on it, and it was uh, from spices. And she used that for her spices, and she would uh, refresh it every now and then. She'd add pickling spice and uh, little red dried peppers, and that's how I learned how to make a roast. Mm -hmm. And she just, you know, would explain the different spices. And I think one of the turning points was when I saw her making little slits in a roast and then slicing cloves of garlic mm -hmm. and lotting, lotting the little slits in the roast with garlic so mm -hmm. that when you cut a slice, there were, was garlic running through oh, it. And, of course, the garlic... Um, you know, uh, flavored the roast. Oh but I mean, it just was a way of life with us. She, and, how how uh, old uh, were you when uh, you did your first cake? Eleven. Eleven. And I did was you, twelve. Do you remember the time when you started going off on your own? Like your mom had taught you the basics, and they were so. You know, she taught you so well and taught you the foundation. Do you remember a time when you said, I want to try something different or something with my personality? Yes. I did. My first cake was a pineapple oops cake. That's what I called it. Mm -hmm. And it had coconut and crushed pineapple in it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't bad. It was pretty darn good. Now, now, she my, decorated cakes. Yes. Now, my first cake was a lemon cake, and uh, it came out beautifully. Thank heavens. Because there were a few times in my life when things didn't come out so beautifully. For me, it was plum you know dumplings. What? That is a learning uh, That's true. Se session. You know, you have to sort of creep up on it and do the right thing. Well, do you remember all the wedding cakes oh, you made? When I was in high school, people were getting married, you know, when they graduated and things like that. 
I must have had 12 people ask me for wedding cakes. And they were my friends, and I couldn't say no. And she never charged them. No, I would never oh, charge them. Goodness. Then so, she came up with a great idea, Nicole. Regal roses. Yes. You were I, 16. I bought 300 small boxes that held... Um, frosting roses. Frosting roses. And I you know, put them in boxes, and a, a neighbor who had a, a store that sold nice things uh, said, why don't you try them in the store? So we did. And you got, didn't you get a... Uh, I got 500 boxes. Yes, but, but you made all the roses and the leaves in different colors. But do you remember that you made a fake cake? Oh, I made a, a full layer of fake cake. It was oh foam. My God. Oh and she was 16 God. years old. What did Amazing. I know? Before and, the internet. Right. And I want to tell you, everything sold out within, I would say, a week. Yes, and then people stopped asking her to make wedding cakes because she'd say, well, you know, you can always get my uh, regal roses <laughs> at, you know, at you know a, the store in in Winthrop Center, so it you know Sheila was pretty pretty advanced for her age. I she see. was a pretty smart chick. So but when you know, did you start? Let me just ask you. So, but your what what food flirts? What makes it? Well, there's many things that make it so um, charming and indifferent. But you get into this cross cultural blend of. Uh, unique and nobody's ever combined what you combine. When did that get started? Well, my mother and father belonged to the Brotherhood Council in Winthrop Center. And, you know, they that was the 1950s during yeah, the Red Scare they, with communism. They made friends, they went to all of the meetings, and they became so. Involved. Involved, you know, that they learned different things that, you know, people baked, cooked, whatever. My mother was always there saying, what have you baked lately? And she find out. And Remember when we went to the Sullivans every Christmas? Oh, and for Jewish kids, it was so exciting. Mm -hmm. We used to decorate the cookies. Shortbread. Mm. Um, Mrs. Sullivan, Dorothy Sullivan made shortbread. And um, she used to get these wonderful little uh, mint-flavored, uh, like peppermint wreaths from a very nice gourmet shop, a store in, in Boston. And they were made of sugar. And some of them were red, some of them were green, some of them were white. And they had little decorations of holly on them and leaves. But the thing is that our parents wanted us to mix and mingle with people and to learn their ways and to, you know, enjoy the way we were brought up with our traditions. But we've always been that way. And we've always wanted to try new things. Now, we have to say, you know, Sheila's 81, I'm 76, and I'll be 77 on November 13th this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you have to say, we have to, you know, accept the fact that you can say we're women of a certain age. And we've always been adventuresome. We've always um, reinvented ourselves. But we found that we had never tried things like sushi or tres leche cake. And, you know, we'd never made pretzels. And it all started when we were doing a holiday special for the cooking channel. And we uh, were trying to bake and cook um, with the firefighters from our local Taylor Square firehouse. And that was a lot of fun. And before we could actually do that show, we went to New York and we met with a man named Bruce Seidel, who at that time was the uh, Vice President for Programming and Development at the Food Network and the Cooking Channel. So he took us to lunch with our producers to, at Morimoto. And as you know, Morimoto is an iron chef. 
and the food was wonderful. Sheila and I chickened out. You notice that food uh, reference there. We chickened out, mm -hmm. and we ordered black cod, which was wonderful but and cooked. Everyone else ordered sushi. So Bruce said at the end of the meal, have you ever had sushi? And I said, no, we've never had raw fish. So he said, would you like to try it? So I said, sure. And Sheila and I each tried a different type of sushi. We threw a little wasabi on it. Mm -hmm. And it was surprisingly good. And he said to us, are there other things you haven't tried? And I mm -hmm. said, yes. I said, we've never, you know, had a ramen bowl. We've never, you know, made things like pretzels and, you know, things like that. And he said, um, you know, someday I'd like to make a series with you, do a series with you. He said, you know, sort of fish out of water. Mm. So anyway, um, we were writing a cookbook and Bruce left the cooking channel and the Food Network to do other things. And then we reconnected because I saw something about what he was doing on the Internet. And he said, you know, I still want to do a series with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people would be jumping up and down and hugging themselves and saying, wow, <laughs> this great guy, a producer, yeah. wants to do. And we say, we're not really we're ready. ready. We're busy <laughs> making, oh. <laughs> doing the book. Yeah. And he said, that's okay. He said, when you're through doing the book, he said, we're going to get together and let's stay in touch. And we did. So anyway, in 2015, he came out to Cambridge and he brought a camera and he wanted to know how we would be on camera and if we could actually, you know, talk on camera. Mm -hmm. We could be sort of spontaneous and live. He, well, met, other, he, he had no idea what he was getting into. Oh, baby, he <laughs> got it. <laughs> but the, the thing is, too, and I think your audience might be interested in this, he, I think he wanted to see how these two old babes uh, would do <laughs> on camera. Uh, could they, what was their stamina like? Oh. You know, you know, because when you could they we, hack it? Well, when we do an episode, uh, we put in 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 hour days. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, um, he was pleasantly surprised. And I just want to let you know that the shows are not scripted. Ah. And everybody does everything. You know, you, you look at some of these wonderful shows and series on television, and sure enough, they've got 100 or 50 people, you know, in the crew and cast. And, you know, we, got, we have six people, and we had mm -hmm. two culinary uh, production assistants. Everybody did everything. Bruce cleaned off Sheila's car from snow. Uh, he vacuumed <laughs> the rug. Um, our wonderful uh, supervising and culinary producer, De Denise Swidey, did everything from, um, you know, uh, frosting a cake on top of a washing machine in the basement oh, to goodness. cleaning the bathroom. I mean, so we all it's like a little it. family. It, it you is. know what? It definitely was a family, and we had a wonderful time. And of course, you know, Bruce is from L.A., so mm -hmm. he didn't realize that the the second and third months in March oh. are not the best months to, to shoot in New England. <laughs> so we ended up going to Provincetown. In the middle of a blizzard. I saw and, that episode. And we were right behind the snow plow. <laughs> and we were singing in the back seat. And, yeah. and the cameraman, Andrew, and director, Andrew Robertson, was in the front seat. And he was uh, taping us. Uh, and it was just uh, a fabulous... And, and the sound person, the cameraman, Adam uh, Kaufman was in, you know, it was one of those sort of vans where there's a seat in back, way in back. He was out, he was there with the sound machine and, you know, that equipment. So we really had a lot of fun. You know and what strikes me, Marilyn, is in watching your episodes, and not to sound sort of cheesy, but 
there's so much love when you invited um, your brand new friends over who had taught you about ramen, who had taught you about diff their different cooking, and you brought them over and you combined all this. There was just this sense of it was such it was such a tender scene. Well, I think you're very perceptive, Nicole, and I have to ask you a question. Have you ever seen a an Asian American man drinking sake and eating pastrami ramen kugel? <laughs> I can tell you I have never seen that. Well, now you have. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there was this sense that there's the people you're it it it, it looked like Every representative of, of culture, of every, it was just this welcoming, like, we don't have um, our backgrounds in common, our, maybe our gender, who knows, but there was this sense of we all are together enjoying this delicious food and appreciating each other. And we taught each other. And that's what's so important. It's a celebration of the multi-ethnic diversity in this country. Mm. There is a civility about the show. Mm. We respect everyone, and we respect their traditions. And we respect mm. our own traditions, too. Mm. I like mm. to think of the word companion. It comes mm. from the word calm, is with, and pane, or pan, which is bread. So a companion is someone you break bread with. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I'd like you and your audience to picture something. Picture a table. Put a chair on one side of the table. Put a chair on the opposite side of the table facing the first chair. Now you have a place to sit with someone. Now you have a place to eat with someone. Now you can start a dialogue. And I honestly feel, Sheila came up with a great expression, a great, um, I won't call it a slogan because it's more important than a slogan, but it's a saying. And it's food without borders. Mm. And I just think if people sat down and shared a meal, they would see that they are more similar than they are different. This is your way of contributing to healing the world. Well, True. you know, that's our <laughs> job. Sheila, Sheila agrees with me. That's our job. And she's, she's going to get a few words in here because I've sort of been enjoying, you know, talking with you, Nicole. But you have to remember that at this time in our lives, especially it is our job to do good things mr rogers used to say in to children in times of great stress or catastrophe who to whom do you go to you go to the people who help or are helping mm -hmm. and the truth is every day sheila and i get up and we say how can we do something good for someone and I'll tell you, if you're thinking about how to do something good for someone, you're not worrying about an ache or a pain. You're not worried that you're getting older and you have a wrinkle here and a wrinkle there. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, in our family, we don't have wrinkles. We have pleats. <laughs> and, you know, we just don't even discuss wrinkles. They're just little pleats. You and don't care. We it's just not care. important to you. It just it sounds like for you, it's a waste of time. It, it is. And time at this age, Sheila, is it's very precious. precious. Oh, she didn't even let me say precious. Well, now you can say, okay, Nicole, why don't you ask Sheila your next question so that she'll... Okay. And I will be very good, and I'll, I'll try not to take over. <laughs> I'll give Sheila, you a chance. What, what would you like to talk about? What... What's important to you as part of this conversation? Well, we haven't talked about what we did in our later life, which began like at 15, 16, 17. I may have been 20. But we had another whole life. And we had many other lives 
in our lifetime. You know, we keep reinventing ourselves. It's not the same old thing. Well, I, I am going to break in here because I want to compliment <laughs> Sheila. You know, there's um, a, tele a television and radio personality in Boston, and his name is Jim Browdy, and he is, I think he's a wonderful guy. Very he smart, is. sharp, and a great he, sense of humor. And, and he knows how to bake. And he knows how to bake. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, we were doing a radio show with him, and he said to me, you know, I was doing my shtick and, you know, talking, and Sheila was trying to get a word in inchwise. <laughs> and he said, you know, Marilyn, has anyone ever referred to you as a verbal dominatrix? <laughs> and I said, not until you just did. <laughs> But what I wanted to say about Sheila, and I'm very proud of this, she graduated from Mass College of Art and Design in 1958. She was 21 years old, never been away from home. She had the courage to go with a very good friend of hers, Dorothy Orloff, to New York. And they stayed at the Studio Club, which was a YWCA, and Sheila degree was in fashion design and illustration and she knew that she had to go to New York to get her experience and she spent nine months there and she learned a lot. She came back here and she was fortunate enough to get a job designing here for William Collier and Son and enough of her uh, clothing her designs, pieces of clothing that were sold, would fill Fenway Park for a whole season. How she was, was it for designer. you when when she left to go to design school, when she went left for New York, was that the first time that the two of you had been separated? Yes, yes. and I was devastated. But she came to New York. I came to New York. I showed her the big town. She showed me the big town. We had a wonderful time. We, we had went a wonderful to time. And... We went to plays, and it was just wonderful. And uh, we went to uh, Schraff's for Sundays. And... Oh, I remember Schraff's. Do you remember the, the uh, sandwiches on cheese bread? I don't know, but do you remember also they had um, Chock Full of Nuts coffee shop? Oh, Sheila has stories about that. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm zipping my lip. Well, do you remember that you used to give, you had a special guy that you gave 25 cents to every day so we could buy a sandwich? Oh, yeah, when we were walking along, when I was going to work. Was yeah, and when we went to Chock Full of Nuts. Yeah. And, is that uh, still is that that doesn't exist no, anymore? No, I don't. Think I think so. they have a coffee brand. I think. Yes, yes. No, Sheila. Sheila would walk to work. Yeah, and I would just same you know, guy every day. I know, and he could use a well, sandwich or something. Well, you know, she was probably making pretty good money then, eighty five dollars a week, but she was living in New York, and she was living at the YWCA, the Studio Club. Well, anyway, I never knew this, Nicole, until a few we uh, months ago. Uh, she said, oh, yes, yeah, she said, I saw the same man every day. She mm -hmm. said, sandwiches were 25 cents. And she said, I would give him 25 cents a quarter every day so he had lunch. Now, I am so proud of her. Obviously, our mother and father you know, left Taught us, us well. Yeah, they left mm -hmm. us a real moral legacy. Can you and talk a little bit about what what is next for you? You've pretty much done everything a baker could possibly, you know, a dream of. Well, you know, winning these awards, the best of the best, Bobby Flay. What what's next for the Brass Sisters? Well. One of the things is that we, uh, the Food Flirts, which was very gratifying to watch, was one of three finalists uh, as the best television series uh, on location. And the, um, the, we were finalists for the James Beard Foundation. Mm -hmm. What a thrill that was. And it, it just was so reinforcing. And there was so much love. It was wonderful. 
and we're hoping to do more shows. We have invitations from fans, from viewers, from Cincinnati. They want us. They want to treat us to three-way chili. They. We have people from mm. uh, Huntsville, Alabama. We have people from Montana. People from Brooklyn. I mean, they are so wonderful. And one one other thing, we heard from a gentleman who had undergone quadruple bypass surgery. And he said, dear brass sisters, I just want you to know when I was recuperating from my operation, I was feeling very sad and very alone. And then I watched your shows. He said, thank you for helping me through a period of loneliness. Now, mm. that's, that's something that money can't buy. But I think the next step is really going to be hard work because it's hard work for everyone who has a show. We're going to have to look for underwriters and funding. And, mm. you know, we're up for it. You know, we're very optimistic. And, you know, we just feel that this is such a great series. And it's great not because of us. It's great because what the series means to the viewers. And, you know, it's just wonderful. And we have another thing we want to do. We have a lot of wonderful memories about growing up in Winthrop and our families and our friends and what it was like to grow up in a small town in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And we're working on a proposal for a new book. It's called Milk and Honey, Stories from a Jewish American Childhood. Now that's the working mm -hmm. title. And they were going to be recipes, mm -hmm. like my mother's Blueberry Valence recipe. And mm -hmm. uh, Sheila's gonna do a holly recipe. And we're just, and it's going to be traditional foods and also foods that people ate during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And mm -hmm. it was just such a comforting time for us. It was a nurturing time, and we want to share that with people. And it was a different time because we lived in a Jewish neighborhood. It was an enclave. Um, mm -hmm. There were lines drawn, you know, certain... Uh, people could not buy houses in other parts of the town. Thankfully, that has changed, and we like to think that we're part of making those changes. But, you know, there's another thing, too. We've always tied together what we've learned from one experience when we have another experience. We became um, antique dealers when Sheila wanted to have her apartment painted, and we had a apartment sale. And that was a period when we had left very good jobs to spend time with my father who had colon cancer. And we had two wonderful years with him. And his father had had a junk shop in Chelsea, Massachusetts. So we got daddy involved. And I really think it made those two years really, really good for him and for us. He died after being in the hospital only two weeks. He died eating chocolate ice cream and watching the Red Sox mm. win. Oh. So, you know, we everyone said, don't leave your jobs. And we said, no, we want to spend time with him. But the thing is, we began to collect culinary antiques and cookbooks. And now we have about 5,000 pieces of culinary antiques, and we use them on our television shows, and we use them in our books as props, and we have our own research library. And, you know, some people have a summer home. We have a research library. But <laughs> it's been a life, and it's not over yet, and we want to make every minute, every second, every minute count. And... You know, mm -hmm. I thank God old age doesn't happen overnight. Speak for yourself. Well, what do you think, <laughs> Sheila? <laughs> One morning I get up and I say, oh, my heavens, what happened? Where are those wrinkles coming from? Those oh, pleats, yeah. <laughs> those pleats. 
the pleats. But you know, I so let me just can can I just sure. ask you um because I know that there's something else that you're very passionate about, and it's not necessarily about cooking. Lately, you have uh, undertaken some work around anti-bullying. Yes. And I... Can you talk a little bit about I that will. and why that's important I will to because you? it's a very important topic to us. And it should be to a lot of people. Um, I was, this is Marilyn. I was chubby. I was a, 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 I was a fat kid who wore glasses and got good grades. And I used to wear um, knee socks. And it wasn't unusual to see, you know, one of the knee socks sort of crawling down toward my ankle. I mean, <laughs> I, I was, a, you know, I was a kid. And we had a situation in town where there was one school bus. And by the time it reached Seafoam Avenue, there were no seats. But some of the kids from a Ritzia section of Winthrop would save seats for their friends. And I felt, you know, me, I, that if I paid my dime, then I had a right to a seat. And this is the way I've always been. Um, so I would sit down and it got to the point where the girl or girls would push me off the seat. And finally, mm -hmm. one of them held up a mirror in front of my face. I was probably anywhere from 12, 13 years old, 14 years old. And you know what a teenager, you know, is like that. A teenager is sensitive, you know. Uh, am I pretty enough? Am I smart enough, you know? So there I am in my thrift shop clothes, my Filene's basement triple markdowns. And these kids have money and they live in nice houses. And she takes out a mirror and puts it in front of my face and says, see how ugly you are. Mm. Well, mm. you know, I had a lot of that. And I had um, a young guy who was actually chubby himself uh, write something very nasty uh, on the inside of my desk. We had desks that, you know, the top went up. Well, what I decided yeah. to do, he I will say, you know, it's almost like profane. He wrote in chalk, you fat slob. Forgive my language. Mm. But I called his mother. I was 12 or 13 years old. And oh I called up gosh. his mother and I introduced myself as his classmate. And I said, your son has done something very hurtful to, to me. And I told him her what it was. And she said, I will have a talk with him. The next day he came in and he apologized. And since then, mm -hmm. I've met some of the kids who bullied me. And it turned out that they turned out, to repeat a word, that they turned out okay. And they remembered bullying. And they are very ashamed of it. And... Interesting. And... The th was, it, was it a... Um... Uh, 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 an anti-Semitic flavor to it, or no, the good just thing that... was the good thing was it wasn't. It was an anti-Marilyn flavor to it. I see, I see. And you know, mm -hmm. the thing is, it's tougher now because of the internet, and you mm -hmm. can sort of, you know, uh, create an identity on the internet, and you can bully people that way. And there's so much violence, violence in the yes. world that, you know, right. I think it's good to speak up. But I would say try to get someone to speak up for you, that that in itself is a good step. Once again, our, our friend, uh, Mr. Rogers, go to the people who will help. Now, I have a message for the people who will help or should help. I think it is criminal when... A minister, a rabbi, um, a priest, a uh, superintendent of schools, a principal, a teacher, a family friend will not step up to the plate to defend someone mm. who is being bullied. Bullying mm -hmm. doesn't just go away. It It's there. And it's like, it's like a, 
an open wound and it has to be healed. It has to be treated. And and with all of your successes and all of your accomplishments, it sounds like that experience really stuck with you. It made me stronger. Sheila had the same experiences. Yeah. And remember the shoes you wore, you wedgies? Oh, I wore a pair of shoes that I bought secondhand, and they were beautiful. They were wedgies. Yeah, they were wedgies. And mm. uh, someone looked at me and said, who do you think you are wearing those? They're ugly. Hmm. But, and, you know, it, it made us what we are. You can take value from something ugly and evil mm. and make something good happen because of it. And that's why... Well, you had some... I mean, both of you had some real um, confidence. I mean, you, Marilyn, as a kid, 12 or 13, to say, I'm going to take it upon myself to call this kid's mom. Most most 12 or 13-year-old girls, I think, would not do that. I think you're right. But I came from a family where our mother and father not only were members of the Brotherhood Council, they were town meeting members. They were mm. presidents of the Brotherhood and Sisterhood in our synagogue, Temple to Fair with Abraham. And my mother started the Hebrew school and the sisterhood at Temple to Fair with Abraham. And my father was... Um, he, we were told our father was one of the three top graduates of Mass College of Pharmacy. And so you had confidence. These people, you knew our that. parents spoke yeah. up. My father mm -hmm. worked for Tufts New England Medical Center, and people would come in the 1950s and 60s to the counter there, and they would try to buy their medication, and they'd be counting out the money in pennies and nickels and dimes. Mm -hmm. And my father would say to them quietly, if you go to that office over there, they will help you pay for your medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a... So this runs in your blood. It does. And that is part of Judaism, that you mm -hmm. have to do good things. Mm -hmm. It's part of our religion, our tradition. And it's common sense. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you've been fortunate enough to be blessed with either talent or money or time, then you should share it. Mm -hmm. That's been your, it sounds like that's been your philosophy, both of you. It, it has, yes. hasn't it? Mm -hmm. What would you say to my audience who are, uh, you know, um, looking at a different phase of their lives now? They may have raised a family or worked, and now they're looking at a whole different landscape, and they don't know where to start because they've spent so much time in their careers or being parents, um, being moms, being caretakers of maybe their parents. Um, maybe their kids. And uh, my experiences with some of my clients is they just don't know where to start because they've never asked themselves the question, you know, what am I good at? What do I love? They haven't had time. What, what would your advice be? Sheila, you want to say? Yes. Keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. <laughs> what I really would <laughs> say. No, that she was joking. <laughs> I was joking. No, okay. but the truth is, if you keep your eyes open and look around you and see how people react, you see people go into a grocery store and they take out a couple of loaves of bread and they put one back because they feel they can't afford it. And the thing is, we should try to help people like that who are, I hate to say the word, ashamed of asking for help. There are people who should have the SNAP program, the old food stamp program, and they're too proud to get it. Or they're too proud to go to a senior center and have breakfast uh, or lunch. Or, you know, don't be ashamed to go to a food bank. 
Sheila and I, when we, you know, we've nursed three people through terminal illnesses. And when we were taking, you know, care of my father, thank God he didn't need a lot of nursing, but just spending time with him and talking to him, making sure he had, you know, the food he wanted and things like that. Um, you know, I just think that you have to realize that there are different phases in your life. And sometimes you're a caretaker. Sometimes um, you're an innovator. Um, we never married by choice, and we never had children. And I feel, and Sheila feels, that we can do more for other people's children. That was the reason we never married. It happened that way. And the thing is, we had a friend who used to use this old saying, and it's trite, I know. You know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Well, I would say make lemon curd, because it's very good on... <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah, and it's wonderful on a scone or, you know, a nice a filling, tart. a tart or a filling sure. between, oh, a, you know, goodness. a nice uh, butter cake. <laughs> But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, this should be an exciting time. The first thing, you know, me, I, I don't hesitate to say anything. Take care of your health. Make sure okay. that even though your kids have flown the nest, or you know, you're divorced, or you know, sadly you've been <clears throat> widowed, you've got a lot to offer. Don't kid yourself. Okay. Age does not is not a detriment. Age is you know, it, it's sort of like you have a, these special files that you can go back to, you know, and, you know, it's wisdom. You know, you're smart be, because, you know, you can go back into your, you know, memory bank and you've got wisdom and th you know how to use mm -hmm. those memories. And, and I think you should be aware that this can be a very adventuresome time. You know what? Take a chance. Don't worry about what mm. people think. I used to worry about what I wore and that I was fat. I remember uh, we had an event in New York uh, before the James Beard uh, dinner and, and award ceremony. And, you know, I was asked to speak. And the place was packed. And it was full of friends and associates. And I started by saying, I'm old and I'm fat deal with it. And that's the way I feel. So I'm fat. So I'm old. So I'm getting a few pleats, as we call them in our family. Um, so what? Who knows what's around the corner? It could be something wonderful. But you have to take care of your health, physical and mental. You have to communicate. You have to spend time with people. Do not isolate yourself. I, a doctor I knew once said that loneliness killed more people than illness. Mm -hmm. All right, Sheila wants to say something. I don't think there's one word I could possibly add, but I'm going to. Good for you. Okay, mm -hmm. I have the floor. You have the floor and the ceiling. And the rug. And the rug. Okay, don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, okay. your l life doesn't always stay the same. You know, if you're having a hard time getting to your grocery store and you can't carry or schlep, as we say, heavy bundles, mm -hmm. go around to different places, ask people, you know, what do they do? And you would find that there are special help, the special help for people who need help. And it's not something to be ashamed of. People go now, I see them in buses. They're all different colors and shapes and sizes. The buses are the people. Both. Both. <laughs> and they go, they're taken to a grocery store. A different they, one every week. And they can get their food. They get help carrying, or as we say, schlepping bundles. You know, this mm. is so important. Just because you were champion swimmer when you were young doesn't mean that when you're 80, you know, you don't need a little help. I would like to say something. We have a wonderful service in Cambridge, 
and I believe it, it also services Somerville. It's called Door to Door. And they will mm. take you to a different grocery store every Wednesday. They um, mm. are wonderful. They will also, um, you know, to help you with your bundles, you know, so that you can, you know, bring them to the you know, front or back door. And oh. it's wonderful. And they will also take you to and from doctor's appointments. And that's a wonderful wow, service great. at no charge. You know I, you know what it sounds like? I'm trying to kind of uh, summarize your philosophies. And it sounds like you're saying you really want to engage in your life, both by giving of yourself and also not being afraid to ask. take, to no. ask. And there's this sort of back and forth that I give... I, you know, I, I help, I, you, one of the expressions is, you know, I pay it forward, right. I look for someone who needs my help, and I'm also not afraid to take help. So it's kind of a, you know, a give and get balance. It is. That's how you balance your life. And you have to know mm -hmm. to whom to go to. If you mm -hmm. go to the wrong person, you're not going to get what you want. And it might be a very disturbing experience. But if you go to the mm -hmm. right people, um, it's like walking through a door. Okay, how do you find oh. right people? Well, you I think ask your friends. Ask your friends. Go to a senior center. And you know what? Mm -hmm. Become an advocate. That's one of the greatest things of being older. If you see something that isn't right, or you see someone mm -hmm. who is old or physically or mentally challenged and i should say older um <laughs> but somebody physically challenged mentally challenged and they're being abused or they're being uh treated in a very demeaning manner speak up to the right people and you know mm -hmm. my uncle maury used to say choose your battles and this is a mm. good part of this is a big part of growing up where you don't go off and, you know, just start uh, yelling, screaming, or uh, berating someone. Choose your battles. Okay. Think ahead. Pick the right people to talk to. And one of the lessons, mm -hmm. there are two other lessons, life lessons I've learned. One of them is you don't have to answer every question that is posed to you. You have a right to your opinion, even if you want to keep it to yourself. The other one is that you may make a complaint to someone who's in charge of a group or an organization. They're not going to say to you, oh, that's, that situation is going to be taken care of immediately, or that will stop. What they're going to do is they're going to go back to where that situation originated and they're going to take care of it. But they're not necessarily going to say, oh, thank you for telling me, you know, to, by tomorrow that'll be taken care of. So you have to be patient? You have to be patient, and you have to realize that they don't want to lose face. Nobody wants to admit. It takes a big person to admit a fault or something that they haven't done that they should have done. And this is how a lot of, you know, companies that are like communities work that they will go back and say, I had a very important phone call from a woman who really knows what she's talking about. She could document occasions when someone was abused on a bus or abused at, or insulted at a senior center or a grocery store. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about it? it? Takes courage to speak up. You know, either you're going to win a popularity contest, or you're going to be your own person. Mm, I see, I see. So uh, we've covered so <laughs> such richness, such uh, you know, listening to your history, your your values, your philosophies, and I would like to direct our listeners to find out more about the Brass Sisters. So, where is the best place well, to find out more? Well, they can friend us on Facebook. Uh, there are mm. we have three pages. We have Sheila Brass, we have Marilyn Brass, 
and we have the food flirts. But we'd love to okay. have, we'd love to hear from them, and we would like them to visit us on our website, and it's www.thebrasssisters.com. So mm -hmm. please visit us, write to us, become mm -hmm. friends. Uh, we like to post a lot of essays, not just, you know, one-liners, and uh, we've gotten wonderful response, and we really would love to connect with you. Oh, boy, that just sounds so delightful. Um, Marilyn and Sheila, it has been such an honor uh, to, to speak with you. We share a lot of uh, love for baking and uh, giving love through baking and some of our history and our ethnicity is the same. And I just, I just so appreciate what you're doing, bringing goodness to the world. It's been my honor to speak with you this morning. Thank you so Thank much. You. It has been our honor Honest. and our pleasure to speak with you too. Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at nicolechristina.com. And please consider becoming a patron of the show. You will get access to exclusive bonuses and you will be part of the Zestful Aging community. Keep us going strong. Go to patreon.com slash zestful aging. See you next time for another episode of Zestful Aging.